This talk will be an informal survey of complex projective surfaces um, with Kadara dimension equal to zero. So you remember we had an, um, a very rough classification of surfaces according to the Kadara dimension, which could be um, minus infinity, zero, one, or two. And in the previous talk, we talked about the surfaces of Kadara dimension minus infinity and showed they were all ruled surfaces, or at least stated that. And this time, I'm just going to do a quick survey of the ones with Kadara dimension zero. So I'll first of all give a quick sketch of how you classify them, and then I'll give a few examples. So the classification of um, these surfaces um, uses a basic identity due to Noether. I should say this is due to Max Noether. Um, the famous Noether is Emmy Noether. Her father was Max Noether, who was also actually a pretty good mathematician, although people kind of forget about him because uh, I don't know. Um, I don't really know why people forget about him. Anyway, Max Noether's formula um, says 12 chi is equal to C2 plus C1 squared. Um, this is actually a special case of the Hitzebrook Riemann Rock formula in higher dimensions. Um, Noether, of course, didn't state it in this form. Um, um, unfortunately, algebraic geometry notation completely changes every few decades. So Noether's original statement is almost impossible for people to understand if they've grown up with modern notation. Um, anyway, and just remind um, what these things are. Here, chi is the holomorphic Euler characteristic. So chi is equal to 1 minus h01 plus h02, where these are the Hodge numbers I discussed in the previous lecture. C2 is the second Chern number, which is equal to the Euler class or Euler characteristic of the surface. That means it's topological Euler characteristic. And C1 squared is another Chern number. And in this case, it's equal to the intersection number of the canonical bundle with itself. Um, now, in the special case when the, um, suppose the Kadara dimension is equal to zero, and you shouldn't confuse the Kadara dimension, which is a Greek kappa, with the canonical class, which is a big K. Um, so um, so uh, if we write out what this says, it says 12 minus 12801 plus 12, 802 um, is equal to 12 chi. And if if the Kadera dimension is zero, then um, H02 must be either zero or one. If the canonical class is zero, then H02 is equal to one. And if the canonical class is not zero, then H02 is equal to zero. Um, on the other hand, um, this number here vanishes if the Kadara dimension is equal to zero. Um, and the number C2, which is the Euler class, is um, um, B0 minus B1 plus B2 minus B3 plus B4, where BI are the Betty numbers which are the dimensions of the ordinary homology groups. And this is equal to 2 minus 4, 8, 0, 1, plus B2, because um, uh, B0 equals B4 equals 1, and B1 equals B3 equals 2H01, which is equal to 2H10 for a complex projective surface. I should warn you that these equalities don't necessarily hold for non-algebraic complex surfaces. Um, anyway, if we look at this, we can rewrite it as follows. So it just says uh, 10 plus 12H02 is equal to H01 H plus B2. And um, this number here is 0 or 1. And these two numbers 
are both greater than or equal to zero because they're dimensions of vector spaces. So there are only a finite number of possibilities for of solutions for this equation. You can quite easily write them out as follows. So, so here are the possibilities. So H02 must be zero or one, and H01 must be, um, um, well, 8H01 must be at most 10 plus 12H02. Let me just write this out again so let's see what it is. So H01 is pretty restricted. It, it, the, the only possibilities we get are, are this. And from this, you can work out the other Hodge numbers and the um, remaining Betty numbers, and they turn out to be the following. Um, Um, and these give you the four classes of surfaces. You may think there are five classes of surfaces, but this ones do not, these ones do not exist. And these four classes of surfaces are called Enriquez surfaces, um, hyperelliptic surfaces. These ones are the famous K3 surfaces, and these ones are called abelian surfaces. So that's very roughly why you get four different sorts of surfaces of Kadara dimension zero. And what I'm going to do now is just give a few examples of each of these types of surfaces. So first of all, we have the abelian surfaces. Um, these are the analogs of elliptic curves. Well, they're the closest analogs of elliptic curves. Um, so um, in order to classify them, what you do is you map the surface S to its Albanese variety. Um, which is a high dimensional analog of the Jacobian variety for curves. And it's, it's, it's something called an abelian variety. Um, and in the case of abelian surfaces, this map here turns out to be an isomorphism. So abelian surfaces are abelian varieties. Um, so abelian varieties are all of the form um, C to the N modulo a lattice L, where L is um, some lattice. Um, and you've got to be a bit careful here because um, complex manifolds of the form C to the N over a lattice are called complex tori. Um, but the problem is with complex tori is they're not all algebraic. The ones that are algebraic are called abelian varieties. And there's actually a subtle condition the lattice has to satisfy um, in order for it to be algebraic, there has to be a Hermitian form um, so that the imaginary part of this Hermitian form is integral on the lattice L. Now, if if n is one, if you're working in one dimension, it turns out that for every lattice, it's fairly easy to find a Hermitian form um, with this property. In fact, there's more or less a canonical one. But in, if n is greater than or equal to two, then this is no longer true. And there are, there are quite a lot of complex tori that aren't um, algebraic surfaces. They're, they're analytic, but not algebraic. Um, so there are two slightly different classification problems. You can classify the analytic tori, or you can classify the algebraic tori, which are the abelian surfaces. Anyway, we can give some examples of abelian surfaces. First of all, we can just take the product of two elliptic curves. Um, there are also a few examples where you take a product of two elliptic curves and divide out by a suitable finite group, and that's still an abelian surface. Um, we can also take the Jacobian of a genus two curve. 
So you remember that any curve has a Jacobian whose dimension is the genus. So if the curve happens to a genus two, we get a two dimensional surface, which is an abelian variety. Um, people don't study abelian surfaces all that much because pretty much everything you can say about abelian surfaces is actually a special case of some more general theorem about abelian varieties. So the, the theory of abelian surfaces is more or less a special case of abelian varieties. Um, I think I forgot to mention, you can also um, write down the underlying topological space quite easily because it's just a product of, um, so as a topological space, this is just a product of two end copies of a circle. So an abelian surface just looks like a product of four copies of a circle in the same way that an elliptic curve looks like a product of two copies of a circle. Okay, well, there's a sort of variation of abelian surfaces, which are the hyperelliptic surfaces. Um, so we now get hyperelliptic, just, just this. Um, these are also sometimes called bi-elliptic surfaces. And there seem to be two sorts of algebraic geometers, those who call them hyperelliptic and those who call them bielliptic, and they seem to be not on speaking terms with each other. Anyway, these are all constructed as follows. What you do is you take an abelian surface and you quotient out by finite group acting fixed point freely. And sometimes when you do this, you get another abelian surface, um, but um, in general, you don't get an, but, but sometimes the surface you get isn't an abelian surface, but is something called a hyperelliptic surface. So let's just see some examples of this. Um, so first of a typical example might be you take a product of two elliptic curves and quotient it out by a cyclic group of order four, where the cyclic group of order four acts as follows. So I'm going to take E1 to be the complex numbers modulo one i, and I'm going to um, take the automorphism of order two where you map z to i z, and I'm going to take E2 to be C modulo one omega, where omega is any old non-real complex number, and I'm going to let z map Z, the automorphism be Z maps to Z plus a quarter. Um, then this gives you, um, a, the quotient, this quotient gives you a hyperelliptic surface. Um, there turn out to be seven families of hyperelliptic surfaces um, because there are seven different sorts of group you can have in here. And the, the groups you have in here are all products of one or two abelian groups. And they can be written down in obvious notation as these seven groups. Um, so people don't really study hyperelliptic surfaces very much because they're more or less just special cases of abelian surfaces with, with certain rather special automorphisms. Um, next, we come on to the famous or notorious K3 surfaces. Um, so the funny name was chosen by Andre Vey, who named them after Kummer, um, Kayla, and Kadira, who all worked on them. Um, so let's have a few examples of these. The first examples are Kummer surfaces, which are constructed as follows. What we do is we take an abelian surface. And um, we quotient it out by a group of order two. So the abelian surface is um, C squared modulo a lattice. And we quotient it out by the group of order two, which just takes any point X to minus X, where X is some, something in C squared. And this surface has 16 conical singularities And 
we, we, we can just resolve these singularities by blowing them up. And if we do that, you get um, a Kummer surface or K3 surface. Um, well, there are quite a lot of other ways of constructing K3 surfaces. So I'll just quickly mention four of them. First, we can take a branched um, double cover of the projected plane branched over a degree six curve or sex stick. Um, secondly, we can take a degree four hypersurface in P3. For example, W to the four plus X to the four plus Y to the four plus Z to the four equals zero. Uh, thirdly, we can take the intersection of a cubic and a quadric in P4. Or fourthly, we could take the intersection of three quadrics in P5. And people found these four families of surfaces and were a bit puzzled by them because they all seem to be very similar. They've got the same invariants. And moreover, it turns out there's a 19 dimensional family of each of these. Um, you can see this uh, quite easily. For example, for six sticks in P2, um, the number of coefficients of a sex stick is six, uh, is, sorry, seven times eight over two equals 28. So we seem to have 28 dimensional family, but we should subtract one because we, um, if we multiply a, a, a degree six polynomial by a constant, this doesn't affect the curve. And then we should also um, subtract the dimension of the automorphism group of P2, which is eight dimensional. So we get 28 minus one minus eight, which is 19 dimensions for this one. And if you calculate the dimension of all these, you again get 19 dimensional families. Um, in fact, Enriquez found a 19 dimensional family um, in um, projective space of dimension G of degree two G minus two for any G greater than or equal to one. So you can see these four examples of the first four cases that Enrique has found where the, the, these ones have degree four, six, eight, and so on. Um, well, this was a bit of a puzzle and it was sort of explained by Kodaira as follows. Um, what's going on is that we have um, a There is a 20 dimensional family of um, possibly non algebraic K3 surfaces. And this contains um, an infinite number of families of algebraic um, K3 surfaces. So the picture you have is something as follows. You've got this sort of 20 dimensional space and inside it, there are all these um, hypersurfaces of degree 19 corresponding to algebraic K3 surfaces. Um, so you can't really understand what's going on with algebraic K3 surfaces unless you include non-algebraic K3 surfaces. And then you find that K3 surfaces are really all part of a, a single um, irreducible family of surfaces. Um, I should mention that K3 surfaces are Calabi-Yau manifolds. Um, this means they've got a, a calometric with vanishing Ricci curvature. Um, Calabi conjectured this and um, Yao was able to prove it, a, a very famous result. And Calabi-Yau manifolds are, um, seem to be used quite a lot in physics um, because a manifold with vanishing Ricci curvature is a rather nice thing to compactify on. 
Um, so K3 surfaces are the simplest non-trivial examples of Calabi-Yau manifolds. Um, it's, it's possible to abelian varieties of Calabi-Yau manifolds. It kind of depends on how you define Calabi-Yau manifolds, since some people insist they should be simply connected. So K3 are the, uh, are the easiest examples of simply connected Calabi-Yau manifolds. So the final class of algebraic surfaces are the Enrique surfaces. So um, um, the original example is motivated by the following question. Um, so Castel Nuovo proved that a surface with uh, irregularity and second plurigenus equal to zero implies the surface is rational. And this was a little bit of a ugly result because instead of using the second plurigenus, it'd be much nicer if you use the first plurigenus. So he asked if the, if the irrationality and the first plurigenus, which you remember is the same as the geometric genus, are both zero, does this imply the surface is rational? And Enriquez showed that the answer was no. Um, and his original example is as follows. What you do is you take a tetrahedron, um, which is going to look something like this. Um, I've forgotten how to draw a tetrahedron there. So we're algebraic geometers. So if, if we were geometers, you would draw the tetrahedron like this. But algebraic geometers think of these lines as going on indefinitely. So the tetrahedron looks like this. And what we do is we take a degree six um, surface. Um, with double um, lines along the six edges of the tetrahedron. And this surface is singular, but the normalization is an Enrique surface. Um, I've no idea how Enriquez came up with such a bizarre example. Um, I suspect what had happened was that Enriquez had studied thousands and thousands of different sorts of surfaces and um, just, just happened to notice this one answered Castelnovo's question. Um, um, there's a, another way of forming Enriquez surfaces, which is you take a K3 surface and quotient it out by... Um, a group of order two acting fixed point freely. So Enrique surfaces have the same relation to K3 surfaces that hyperelliptic surfaces have to abelian varieties. You take the K3 surface or the abelian surface and just quotient out by a finite group. Um, so the, 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 the theory of Enrique surfaces turns out to be very similar to the theory of K3 surfaces. Um, their classification is reasonably well understood. There's a 10 dimensional irreducible family of Enrique surfaces. And um, um, it can be described in a reasonably explicit form. Okay, so that's enough about surfaces of Kadara dimension zero. And the next talk will probably be about surfaces of Kadara dimension one and two.